he's good. Are you guys like, no, you guys are He's a good partner. You guys can hear everything I'm saying. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the John F. Kennedy Jr. Uh, Forum. 
Uh, tonight's uh, event, as you uh, well know, is uh, called Climate Change Hits Wall Street. Uh, what are the risks of inaction? And it's uh, one of what we hope will be several uh, this year forums with regard to this critical issue of climate change affecting the entire world, but uh, obviously of profound political consequences uh, here in the United States. Uh, I'm very delighted to be able to introduce our moderator tonight, who is uh, John Ruggie. Uh, he is the director of the Center for uh, Business and Government here at the Kennedy School. He's also uh, a major faculty member here, having the Evren and Jean Kirkpatrick Professorship of International Affairs. Previously, he had been at the United Nations as Assistant Secretary General and Chief Advisor for Strategic Planning for Secretary uh, Anand, uh, Secretary General uh, Kofi Annan. And um, just to remind folks, uh, here at the Kennedy School and indeed throughout Harvard, there is very extensive uh, research going on on a host of the aspects of climate change, from science to public policy issues to the economics of it. And so we're very delighted uh, to have this panel with us, which follows on a whole day conference. Uh, Professor John Ruggie. Thanks very much, Phil. Uh, welcome to, uh, to all of you. Thank you for being here. As Phil said, we've uh, spent the day in a workshop uh, addressing some of the issues which we hope to crystallize um, this evening um, with your participation. We'll try to keep our remarks as short as possible to maximize opportunities for discussing an extremely important um, a subject that also is quite technical, um, and we have a wonderful panel to help us understand uh, some of the issues better. As Phil said, the subject is the growing financial risk of inaction or inadequate action uh, in the face of global climate change. We don't intend to uh, debate the, uh, the merits or demerits uh, of the Kyoto Protocol uh, tonight. Uh, instead, what we want to explore is how, in the absence of a viable global set of policies um, in climate change, um, other social institutions, including the financial sector, are increasingly shouldering the burden. And we want to understand that dynamic better here tonight. Um, the um, issue of uh, the financial community, the insurance industry, and pension funds in particular um, at the forefront um, of this struggle. The question is important in its own right. What are the, what are the financial risks? Obviously, uh, we care for substantive reasons about that. We also care for political reasons. If the financial risks, or as the financial risks, become better understood, uh, one assumes that the political dynamic uh, in dealing with this issue will also change. Uh, if it becomes clear that, that even industry uh, and the financial community are shouldering part of the burden, presumably they will speak up along with others who care about uh, global environmental sustainability uh, and put pressure on governments everywhere to adopt sensible and sustainable policies. In fact, according to some figures, within about a decade, the annual costs of global climate change could reach somewhere in the neighborhood of $150 billion, which is a lot of money no matter how you look at it. Now, we have, as I said, an outstanding panel to, um, to help us understand these issues. I want to address, I want to introduce them very briefly um, for you before turning to some questions. To my immediate left uh, is John Holdren, my colleague here at the Kennedy School. He is the Teresa and John Heinz Professor of Environmental Policy, and he directs the program on science, technology, and public policy here at the Kennedy School. He's also a professor of environmental science um, uh, at Harvard, a uh, major figure in the field of earth sciences. He belongs to every honorary society that anybody in his field can belong to. Uh, and in the Clinton administration, he also served on the President's Advisory Committee uh, on Science and Technology. Thank you, John, for uh, joining us here tonight. Um, to John's left is Christopher Walker, an attorney. He's a managing director of Swiss Re, which is one of the world's largest reinsurers. Uh, at that firm, he has led several efforts in the area of environmental risk mitigation um, innovation. 
and in identifying business opportunities in providing new solutions to environmental challenges. Uh, he also holds leadership positions in a number of nonprofit um, organizations um, as well. Mindy Luber is an attorney and an MBA, and the executive director of Ceres, um, co-sponsor of the event uh, today, a nonprofit coalition of investment funds and environmental groups. She's also the director of something called the Investor Network on Climate Risk, about which we will hear more later. She's been New England Regional Director of the EPA and um, also served as Senior Advisor and Communications Director to former Massachusetts Governor Michael Dukakis. And then at the far side um, of the panel are two state treasurers, uh, trustees of their pension funds, um, major institutional investors uh, who care deeply about the sustainability of the assets they oversee on behalf of people like me, who care increasingly about how their pension funds do as the years go on. <laughs> Jeb Spaulding is treasurer of the state of Vermont, where he has also been a state senator. He comes out of um, the um, uh, television and information industry, has been general partner in Precision Media Incorporated, which owned and operated radio stations in New England. He's been a leader in the investor network on climate risk, prodding Wall Street investment managers to pay attention to climate rate, uh, climate related risks, uh, and changing Vermont's own proxy <coughs> voting guidelines to help achieve that objective. And then finally, Dale McCormick became the first woman to be elected treasurer of the state of Maine uh, in 1996. She's not an attorney, she's not an MBA, she's a certified carpenter. Good for you. <laughs> like Jeb Spaulding, she's also been a leader in the investor network on climate risk uh, and um, has uh, an interesting encounter, which I hope she will tell us about uh, later, with Exxon Mobil attempting to file a climate change shareholder resolution uh, at that company. Prior to becoming treasurer, Ms. McCormick served in the Maine Senate. So that's the panel tonight. Um, it's going to be an exciting discussion. Uh, and John Holdren is going to get us started in, this is a really dumb question, John. Um, tell us about the science of this. <laughs> and why are people arguing about the science? And do it in two minutes, would in, you please? In, in two minutes or less. OK. The uh, situation in climate science, as everybody knows, is there is a degree of controversy about the uh, nature of global climate change, the degree of risk that it poses to the human condition. But the first thing I would say about it in a two-minute description is that knowledgeable people in the climate field are no longer really disagreeing about the proposition that the climate is changing. They agree it is, that it's changing in a way that is unusual uh, against the backdrop of natural climatic variations. And they also agree that it is now clear that human beings are playing a significant role in this unusual degree of climate change that we're experiencing. Uh, of the last uh, 140 years in which we've had decent thermometer records of the temperature of the Earth, it is uh, absolutely plain now that uh, the, uh, of, the, of the 20 warmest years in the last 140, 19 have taken place since 1980. The 12 warmest years in the last 140 have all taken place since 1990. The evidence is detailed, it is diverse, and it is clear that the climate is changing in a direction which will bring about an average warming, but associated with that, serious alterations in climatic patterns, hot and dry, wet and cold, uh, snowfall and snowmelt, ocean current circulation patterns, and that many of these changes, not all, but many of these changes will be to the considerable detriment of human well-being. Climate controls the productivity of farms and forests and fisheries. It determines the geography of disease. It determines the livability of our cities in summer. It determines the damages that are to be expected from storms, floods, and wildfires and it's mostly going in a direction that's going to be bad 
for humankind. The controversies are now mostly about the details. Exactly how fast, exactly how distributed, what are the levers for dealing with it, how effective would different remedial measures be. There are lots of controversies, but those should not obscure the fact that we now know that we are changing the global climate in a way that overall is going to be bad for the human condition. And the possibilities going out 30, 50, 100 years look very grim if we do not change the behavior that's causing the problem, which is, above all, combustion of fossil fuels for 80% of the world's energy supply and releasing into the atmosphere all of the carbon dioxide that comes from that. Carbon dioxide is a potent greenhouse gas. It warms the Earth on the average. But that warming, while it sounds pleasant in small quantities, is disrupting the climatic system. Thank you, John. Um, Chris Walker, um, you work for an insurance company, and it's probably not an accident that the insurance industry has been at the forefront of the business response or business interest in the issue of climate change. Can you describe to a layperson such as myself what is the variety of financial risks that stem from global climate change, and what's the magnitude, the orders of magnitude of some of those risks? Well, from the insurance industry, and certainly how I got involved in this was that for, for a company like Swiss Re, we had been talking about climate change. We have three climatologists on staff. Uh, we had been talking about climate change since the early 90s. The question became, though, is what we, would we potentially do with the science that we were, we were uh, researching? and as to the, where, what the financial implications are. And one of the things, and just describe it from, from our angle, because I think it's a good overlay as to what, what the problem is, is maybe why others haven't picked up the issue on a financial basis. It has an opportunity to be almost a perfect storm um, in that it could affect every line of our business, uh, from life and health issues, morbidity, mortality rate changes, um, to disease vector changes um, due to warmer um, climate conditions, which cause uh, um, vermin or, or um, insects to last through winters, for instance, where they normally wouldn't. Um, it has the ability to check uh, to affect our property and casualty business. So obviously, the storms, floods, droughts that people think about, um, the, the more severity and frequency of storms um, systems, for instance. And then it also has the effect potential on our investments. Uh, the insurance industry is one of the largest investors in the, in the world. Uh, was something I think about 25% of all institutional investment money comes from the insurance industry. That's how the insurance industry makes money. It invests the premium before it has to pay it out um, on a claim. So the ability that this, this climate change will also affect the investments we invest in and in the, in the companies and the places we invest um, could cause this perfect storm of losses not only through the, the claims, property, casualty, life, and health, but also through the investments we make. And then I just would say also for industry, um, I, I think part of your question that uh, we had uh, discussed earlier was um, about why industry potentially um, has been reluctant to act in the absence of uh, regulation. I think it's partly also because there's not an ability to understand what the effect of regulation or what the effect of regulation would potentially be on them, what the cost factors would be. And no one will undertake, or most companies won't undertake just a reduction of uh, emissions just for the sake of reducing emissions it is not a way an incentive for them to do so. So even, even if there is interest on the part of industry to move the absence of a regulatory framework it creates uncertainty that slows down the willingness to move. Is exactly. That it's, it's the lowest hanging fruit phenomenon. They will only go for the lowest hanging fruit and not actually make the real changes that would be necessary. Thanks Chris. Um, Mindy, you're, you're an attorney and you're a former EPA administ administrator. What, what do you see to be the major um, uh, responsibilities and liabilities of companies related to uh, climate change? Let me back up just for a second. And number one, thank you, Dr. Ruggie, for hosting this. Your center is doing great things, and I think this hopefully fits into your kind of mandate about corporate and social responsibility. But Dr. Holdren, without question, makes the case that one of the greatest problems facing us as a nation and as a world is global warming, and that if we don't act sooner rather than later and take large steps to mitigate the risk, the problem will be the biggest problem that we pass on to the next generation. 
And there is a responsibility on many people's parts, I'm getting to the answer to your question, to address that. Right now we've got a slowdown, a stalemate, a not, no movement in Washington. Some people think we're not going to fix the problem. There is movement elsewhere. Investors, who you hear, will hear from tonight, see the fact that there are financial risks that impact hundreds of companies or thousands of companies and dozens of industries. And there are those companies that must act. They'll act either because they realize the information is real and clear and potentially devastating or they don't act if they don't act, or they'll act because there are legal risks to them. But for an industry like the electric utility industry, who faces all kinds of risks, one very real risk is potential regulation. If, in fact, the McCain-Lieberman or any one of the 10 other bills floating around Congress, or what are the major regulatory regimes floating around state legislatures pass, that could cost companies within the electric utility industry hundreds of millions of dollars per facility to come into compliance with. If they are not looking at that today, if they are not thinking about how to mitigate the risk, how to invest smartly now so they're not caught off guard by a regulatory change. They are in breach of their responsibility to plan, to look at the financial value of their company, not only over the short run, as Wall Street forces and pushes them to do, but over the longer run. Boards of directors of America's greatest companies or of our multinational companies have a duty to plan, to assess risk, to mitigate that risk and to plan not only over a four month period, but over a longer term period and companies need to be doing that. Now Professor Ruggie asked specifically, what are the legal responsibilities or what are the legal concerns companies ought to have? And let me quickly just take a look at what they might be. First of all, the leadership within the investment community is fierce now in terms of wanting companies they invest in to look at these risks. You'll hear from colleagues within tre state treasurers about shareholder resolutions. We've seen 25 shareholder resolutions filed that are getting record-breaking votes. That creates an enormous burden for boards of directors of companies to have to speak to, risk, have to rebut the issue of their owners wanting them to change their practices and may even create legal responsibilities for them. Secondly, seven attorneys general have filed lawsuits against specific companies. This is the next asbestos and the next tobacco. People could ignore it. They could think it will go away. They could think it's not going to amount to anything. But I doubt that anybody in this room believes that this is less phenomenally devastating or important or dramatic, company by company, industry by industry, as an investment issue, as a company issue, or as obviously an environmental issue and an issue that affects the future of our planet. It will impact the value of those companies, whether this first litigation, these seven attorneys generals filing a lawsuit is a winner or a loser, it should create a concern on the part of those companies and on the part of their board members. And finally, board members have a fiduciary duty to assess risk and act on it. If board members of companies who are particularly impacted by climate risk are not looking, are not acting, are not moving to mitigate, are not coming up with strategies, there will be lawsuits against them personally that they are in breach of their fiduciary duty. There are a broad range of legal risks. Which one will hit first, I don't know. But they are real, they are now, they are happening with the Attorney's General lawsuit, and more will follow without question. Well, Jeb Spaulding, if, if it's as clear as, as Mindy states it is that there are these responsibilities um, uh, and, and, and even leg legal obligations, um, what kind of reception do you get um, when you approach uh, companies to disclose more information or to develop um, policies um, uh, re related to their climate change risk exposure. Tell us a little bit about your experience. Well, realizing that uh, most investment managers want to tell you uh, what they think you want to hear, uh, the response is mixed a little bit. And, and generally they look at you politely and say, yeah, yeah, that's, that's an interesting issue. But for the reasons we've already discussed, it's, it's relatively new, it's complicated, it's not easy to describe the situation in, in, in a sentence or two. Uh, I called home this afternoon and, and spoke to a, a banker and, and board member I work with, told him what I'm doing tonight and said, ah, global warming, you know, we've been around, there was an ice age a few million years ago, there'll be another one, it's not our fault. And, 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 and we have to deal with that kind of a perception. And one of the ways we do it is by trying to get information. 
And as a treasurer and working with my colleagues and our board members, we are doing what we can to get greater disclosure and reporting out of companies that our investment managers invest in. And we have had some success. You, you really have to be careful about uh, painting with too broad a brush here. If one were to say, in a general sense, do you think there is enough disclosure and reporting, I'm sure one would say no. But there are many companies out there that have made some legitimate efforts to try to increase the information available to uh, the, in the investing community. Uh, there, there's actually a company in Vermont, uh, the uh, Social uh, SRI, Social Research Institute, or whatever, they, they have a, something called One Report, uh, and there are a whole slew of, of corporations from Shell to DuPont to Johnson & Johnson that have uh, invested to try to come up with a unified reporting process. Because if everybody's coming in and asking for different reports, uh, they get kind of tired of it and it's, it's a lot of work. So uh, I do think in the voluntary end, there are some success, success stories. They are not the majority. Getting the information is difficult. Uh, that's the voluntary approach, Professor. There also are requirements by the uh, Securities and Exchange Commission uh, to, uh, to actually file uh, reports at the time of initial offering or periodically thereafter on material risks to investors. Um, the, the difficulty is, is trying to uh, be clear with people uh, what the risk is here. Uh, we have tried as, as, uh, as, as state treasurers and controllers and other fiduciaries to communicate with the SEC saying that we feel that some clarification that, that climate change is a material risk and should be included in the reports is important. As state treasurers, one of the things that uh, the treasurer of Maine uh, the Treasurer of Vermont, the Treasurer of Connecticut in a leadership role, New York, uh, Maryland, uh, and, and, and a few other states that I can't remember right now, uh, got together and sent uh, a letter to all of our investment managers asking, again, not for the mandatory SEC disclosure, but reports to us through, the, through our network, our investor network here, on how they view climate change, what horizon they think it might affect us in, how they take it into account, uh, that letter was sent out about a month ago, and, and, and replies are, uh, are, are going to be varied as they come in, but they are coming in uh, as we speak right now. So I think as we get more information, we're clear on what we're asking, uh, we should expect for, uh, for greater understanding. And, and actually, I think you know, the bottom line on this is, uh, as, as somebody that's responsible for somebody else's retirement and somebody else's money, I got to make sure that we don't have any landmines that are going to lose us money, and if there are opportunities for us to make money, we should be taking advantage of them. And when we as investors uh, demand that information from the people that we're investing in, we're going to get better information. So I think the efforts that we have as investors, not necessarily mandatory all the time, but saying, look, this is important to us, uh, we'll start to get greater, great, greater compliance from the corporate world. Thanks. Uh, Dale McCormick, what about your experiences? What, what um, um, lessons do you draw from your efforts to get companies to disclose more information and to address the issue of climate change? Um, and uh, do tell us a little about uh, ExxonMobil. <laughs> yeah, well, I think you're ready for a little comic relief by now, aren't you? <laughs> this is way too heavy. For the... So, um, what I've done uh, in Maine, and I'm one of eight fiduciaries of the pension fund, and that means, like, when I go off to the meetings, which last all day, I say to my staff, I'm going to protect your retirement, which is exactly what we're supposed to do. And so in so doing, uh, I filed for the first time a shareholder resolution, which, for those of you who don't know, when you own some stock, and it turns out that <coughs> The state of Maine owns three million shares of ExxonMobil stock. You can uh, file a resolution to ask the board to do something that they might not be doing. So I filed asking them to disclose to me and to Jeb and to other uh, fiduciaries their risk, the, the degree to which their company is at risk to climate change. And so I went down to Dallas, Texas, to this meeting that is like by now famous. I 
question, so you didn't know it was famous, but it's famous. <laughs> and it's famous because the CEO, or the past CEO of ExxonMobil, is somewhat, had a curmudgeonly reputation, maybe even mean-spirited. And um, so I, got, I get up during the, there's, have, you, have any of you filled out those little shareholder, where you, the blue plastic and you have to, yeah, okay. So um, there's 12 things on the agenda, and the second, the first thing is the board of directors, and the second thing was to ratify the auditors. So I get up and I said, uh, may I address a question to the auditor? And Lee Raymond, who is this CEO, former CEO, said, well, yes, there he is. So I asked him whether he has planned for climate risk at all in the audits, whether they've reserved for it or taken it in consi into consideration financially. And he said, well, that's not a question for me. That's a question for management. So I said, well, can I address that to the, to the audit committee chair? And, and the CEO, Lee Raymond, broke in and said, you cannot. You cannot do that. And I said, well, why? And he said, well, because that is, that is for management to decide. This is a whole other question we could discuss sometime because it's not really. And um, the independence of the board. You know, who, I mean, who runs the company, that question. But that's not what we're here to talk about right now. So I, um, I said, well, may I pose it to you, to Mr. Raymond? And he said, well, yeah. Like, he tosses it off. Yeah, you can pose anything you want to me. And he, they all laughed. These people in this auditorium, the Dallas Symphony Orchestra Auditorium, they all started laughing at me, the treasurer of the state of Maine. <laughs> and you might want to laugh at the treasurer of Vermont, but you do not laugh at the treasurer of the state of Maine. And so I said, uh, where was I? Okay, so I'm saying. And so, so I, I said, well, um, let me pose my question. Will you answer my question? And he, then he made everybody laugh again. He said, well, that's another matter. Like, I will if I want to. Well, he had gone too far. And I, I basically, I said, serious, to be serious, now we get serious. I said, it is not a laughing matter. When, when the treasurer of the state of Maine and a fiduciary of three million shares cannot get an answer to a serious question like this, so I embarrassed him, he had to answer me then. And he basically tossed off this answer. I said, oh yeah, what's your question? And I said, "Can you have you reserved uh, to climate risk in, in your financial statements? Have you reserved for the impact, the financial impact it's gonna have on your company? And he uh, said, you can't measure it and it's not likely, so no which is all very smartly worded because that's the only little carve out that the SEC allows companies to not deal with this. So that was my, um, that was my in interaction with ExxonMobil and I, from this I learned that all of you who, all of us, I, I, brought, the sh I brought the voting of the proxies in house this year for the first time and Assistant Treasurer Adam Cray and I voted them all by hand we're now gonna put them, we're gonna compile them and put them on our website and you can all read how the state of Maine voted at maine.gov slash treasurer. And, um, and that's what we need. We need more disclosure, we need more information, we need more light shed on how companies deal with climate risk. And you all and treasurers and fiduciaries are very important in that. Thank you very much. Chris, um, I want to come back to you. About a year and a half or so ago, Swiss Re sent sort of ripple effects throughout the business community by sending out notices to companies for which it provided officer liability coverage and the like, asking information about whether the company had developed um, plans for um, uh, climate change risk management. And all of a sudden, that was all over the newspapers, and you know the Wall Street Journal wrote articles about it, and you caught people's attention. Um, two questions, related questions. One, what's been the follow-up to that, and what other kinds of things like that are you doing to get this issue more into the daily uh, lives um, and, and uh, the genetic structure of companies? Sure. 
Um, well, the Wall Street Journal article certainly had a lot of ripple effects both internally and externally because uh, <laughs> it was actually a misquote um, of what we were actually doing in, 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 in Europe anyway. It was on the cover of the Wall Street Journal. So when our CEO saw it the next morning, he said, sounds like we're being judge and jury on this issue. Um, and uh, we basically they had quoted that we were actually at this point excluding on the directors and officers liability, which is basically coverage the business decisions that um, officers and directors make in companies when they have to deal with the treasurer of Maine, for instance. Um, and for the business decisions that they make and, and the policies that they set for the company. It's to cover them because otherwise they'd be personally liable. The company itself would not actually cover them for their, for their business decisions. So the directors and officers liability insurance is extremely important for that reason. What we're concerned about is obviously we, we feel, we believe in climate change is happening. We believe it's actually very necessary for companies to act now. We're concerned that companies aren't acting. We don't want this to be the next asbestos. We don't want this to be the next tobacco where the insurance industry foots the bill for, um, for things that industry potentially should have done but we weren't quick enough, because um, we're a reactionary um, industry by nature, quick enough to put exclusions in the policies for these type of things. So the idea as an insurance company is we should ask questions, educate our, our, our customers as to what we're concerned about. So the idea was to start with a questionnaire. Every insurance application for directors and officers liability got a questionnaire and, and asked very simple questions. What were you doing in relation to climate change? Is it a strategic issue for you? If you don't have a strategy, why not? type of things. And our management was very concerned that this was going to have a ripple effect, people were going to run to our competitors, et cetera. I only got three phone calls on it, um, two of which were uh, multinational companies saying that we've done battles with our shareholders on other issues and don't want this to be the next one. Can you tell us if we're doing enough? Which was contrary to anything I had expected. And then a third one, which was basically, how do we actually now apply to work with Swiss Re because we really feel we're doing enough and we want to demonstrate that to our management. So it's actually quite positive. So the D&O side, what we're doing now on it, the questionnaire wasn't so effective because uh, it was a little hard to get them to answer adequately. So what we start now with is looking at the carbon disclosure project um, answers, which was uh, nine trillion in, in assets on the management had asked questions of the Fortune 500 as to what they were doing. Um, and uh, so that's our first start. And if they haven't answered that questionnaire, then we actually send our own questionnaire. And then just what else are we doing? We're looking at, for instance, the next issue I see is a big issue from policies that we offer is the business interruption insurance, um, which covers basically for interruptions in business um, due to um, some causation and a concern we have. Um, it's actually almost in a positive sense is that, for instance, companies in Europe um, if they actually now are very proactive and they actually have carbon credits to sell, if their business now is, is interrupted somehow, is this a second revenue stream that we have to factor in to the actual pricing of the insurance? Because there's, a, there's an interruption of a revenue stream. They have emission reduction units to sell that uh, is disrupted because the plant is not in operation. So. Very interesting developments. Um, Treasurer McCormick, let me come back to you. Um, you're a leader in the um, um, investor network on climate risk. Tell us a little bit about it and what needs to happen next to make that a really transformative force um, among institutional investors uh, to create further change on Wall Street. Well, this issue, uh, is, you might have noticed, is about change. Right. I mean, the whole world is not clamoring for ExxonMobil to do the right thing and lower their carbon emissions. We don't have any carbon caps yet and things like that. So anything that involves change, the answer is you got to organize. And um, basically what we did was we organized a group of fiduciaries, Treasurer Spaulding, myself, Treasurer Napier of Connecticut, Treasurer Angelides of uh, California, Controller Hevesy of New York, um, I think uh, Treasurer V. Hill of New Mexico and some others, and some labor uh, pension fund fiduciaries. And we all got together and in a little coalition called the Investor Network on Climate Change, and we've been trying to um, do together, have, have more oomph 
<laughs> together on, on this issue. And um, one of the things we've done, uh, as, as Jeb alluded to, was to um, petition the SEC to uh, make clear that when companies report every year, they have to report on long-term trends and threats to their business in this management discussion and analysis section of their 10K report. And um, we, rather than forcing each of our money managers or forcing, forcing each of our companies or even forget the fact that half of us are, most of us are over half passively invested, meaning we invest in index funds and we cannot vote those proxies. We, we're just there because we're long-term investors. Um, we want the SEC to do in one fell swoop what it will take amazing amounts of money and effort and years to do individually, and that is to make clear to these companies that they expect more than just a swipe on this analysis of long-term trends and threats, and they, and they want a cogent analysis of how the company is at risk for climate change and what they plan to do about it. And basically what we need to do to be more of a force is we need more treasurers, more controllers, more shareholders, um, more people interested, more supporters. And, um, and you may have noticed this is, a, this is an intersection of two things, environmental concern and finance. And it's been hard for me because I believe as environmentally that this is the right thing, but as a fiduciary, I cannot speak from my heart. I have to speak from very prescribed fiduciary duty. And what I think we have been able to do, Jeb and I and Phil and Denise and all my pals in the <laughs> investor network on climate change is to um, shake to, to take the whole debate to another level, actually. I think it was an environmental debate. It is, it is warmer, colder, yes, no, ne ne neener, 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 and all of a sudden, there's another voice that said, um, we have money and we're worried about the, the value of our portfolio and how all these companies are, might lose money, uh, and so we want more information. And it just bumped the whole discussion to another level, and I'm very proud be a part of that. Well, it's very, very interesting from the point of view of students, particularly uh, Kennedy <laughs> School students and others here at Harvard, uh, a couple of observations. One, you give a whole new meaning to, to, to the slogan, think global, act local. Um, and secondly, I think um, it, it, the work that you've done points out how, um, how numerous and diverse the opportunities are to create change. Um, and uh, how it's necessary to understand very specific dynamics, in this case financial markets and investor behavior, in order to push the right buttons and pull the right levers in order to produce change. I think that's encouraging for students in particular to hear who sometimes um, see, st stand back and see that nothing is happening at a macro level, but in fact a lot of things are going on um, at more local um, and more specialized um, you know, levels. You you may have noticed from my bio that I have been somewhat of an activist in my past. I and would never have guessed. Yeah, that's <laughs> true. And, and actually, during, until I found my, my niche here, <laughs> which is basically, this is the activist portion of being a treasurer. I've never been so happy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Jeb Spaulding, we've talked so far mostly about risk, um, identifying risk, uh, managing risk. Let's flip it around and look at the opportunity side. Is there money to be made by doing things different and better vis-a-vis -vis climate change? I think there is money to be made, and I think there's, there's a lot of uh, pretty easily understood evidence that there's money to be made. Uh, before I forget to say this, though, I, I, I hope that some of the students here uh, will check, and I don't know the answer to this, but. Uh, whether the, the Harvard endowment is taking these issues seriously and maybe the pension funds for uh, some of the faculty and employees here because 
I was thinking, Dale, I think you have about eight billion, right? Yeah. <laughs> and we have about two billion. I, last time when my daughter went to school here, I, I mean, the, the endowment for Harvard was more than your oh, pension and ours put so. together, you know? So uh, we got to work on other people too. And there is money to be made. There's two angles to this though. One is, um, it's sort of like, you know, in, the, in energy, uh, if, if you can uh, conserve energy, that's just as good as, you know, producing more energy. <laughs> And if we can avoid losing money and having uh, the Enrons of the world take place with, with uh, environmental liabilities that are out there, that is uh, as good as, as making money. So on the one hand, to the extent we can get good information out, work with our investment managers so that they are, and, and that there, there is more and more research available for them and ways to easily utilize that information to avoid investing in companies that are likely to explode on you, uh, that's good. And, and that's one side that I think is important to reference. As far as making money, I mean, you know, you, the people talk a lot about these days about uh, uh, Toyota or Honda versus uh, GM, let's say, and investing in, in environmentally uh, 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 advanced technology. And there is money to be made there. Perhaps one of the best examples that, that I can think of uh, is the fact that uh, some of the, the, you know, up, up until fairly recently, the people that were running money, the money managers that were involved in thinking about issues of, of a, a host of environmental or socially responsible issues were largely small and kind of niche kinds of things. And uh, now uh, you'll see some of the biggest uh, investment firms, State Street Global Advisors, Barclays Global Advisors, that are developing uh, products and research to back up the fact that this can be something that will enhance returns in the medium and long, long run. And so I'm very encouraged about what we see moving forward in terms of, uh, of people realizing that this is someplace that, uh, that they don't need to be afraid of, that something that actually provides uh, uh, shareholder value for, for their pension funds. And actually, one thing that I was kind of surprised at uh, is that I actually personally believe that the, the corporate world is kind of even, even if it's not entirely altruistic, has figured out that there is money to be made here. Uh, and it's actually the investor world, and to some extent the political world, that's a little slower on the uptake here. Uh, and I, I think that uh, you know, through the, the, the leadership of, of some of the, the, the folks we've already referenced, you will start to see the investor world rewarding those corporations that are thinking proactively and that will feed on itself and encourage other investors and other corporations to do the same. Thank you, Jeb. Um, John, I want to turn to you. You are not only a scientist, you've also been a science advisor. And you've studied the science advisory process, you've written about it. What's wrong with the system? You tell us that there is overwhelming scientific evidence, that there is widespread consensus, uh, and yet um, political leaders aren't listening to the science advisors or they're not getting the right kind of science advice. How do we fix this system? What do we do? Well, I think we need to make our political leaders a little more accountable for their decisions. Uh, this would be a good season in which to ponder that uh, <laughs> option. Uh, here, here. The, uh, in, the, in the Clinton administration, in which I was uh, engaged as one of the president's uh, Committee of Advisors on Science and Technology. We had a lot of back and forth uh, in, the, in the White House about the climate change issue. Uh, Vice President Gore understood the issue extremely well scientifically. He understood it so well he could give a credible lecture about climate science to a room full of scientists. In fact, I'd seen him do it. Uh, President Clinton came to understand it very well too. They agreed uh, to substantially increase research and development on, on low carbon and no carbon energy technologies to put in place a variety of tax incentives to try to get uh, companies and individuals to buy uh, technologies that would be advantageous from that point of view. They went to Kyoto, Vice President Gore went to Kyoto, signed a quite ambitious uh, emissions target uh, for the United States, uh, but they were not willing to put in place a mandatory mechanism for achieving that target. That was a great disappointment for me. We argued about it a lot. They thought about the pros and cons. It wasn't that they weren't listening. 
wasn't that they weren't hearing the advice, but it was thought to be politically infeasible to embrace either a carbon tax or an emissions cap with tradable permits at that time. And of course, the evidence at that time, while quite compelling, was not nearly as powerful as it is today. And in my conversation with President Clinton about this in June 97, he said to me, I'm convinced, the Vice President is convinced, but you've got to help us convince the Congress, the American public, and American industry before we can really get this done. In the current administration, they uh, have a rather different attitude, I think. Both the President and the Vice President are oil men. They either don't really believe it uh, or don't want to believe it that climate change is a, is a serious problem, uh, or they're deliberately misrepresenting it. I can't be sure which. Uh, but this administration has literally tried to suppress some of its own documents produced in its own agencies related to climate change science, has tried to alter reports being prepared for public release by the EPA on climate change, generated a big scandal on uh, the manipulation of, of, of scientific uh, information. Uh, they have done a few good things. They have increased uh, research on fuel cells and hydrogen technology. They have increased research on carbon sequestration. They have an announced a target for carbon emissions reductions based on carbon intensity, that is the ratio of carbon emissions to economic activity, which is a good idea. Because by basing your target on that ratio and saying we're going to get more efficient, we're going to get more economic activity but less carbon, then you escape the problem that it looks like you're trying to put a lid on economic growth, which is a generally unpalatable proposition. Uh, but they too have refused to embrace any form of mechanism for achieving that target. And uh, I'm afraid that that will continue to be true uh, for the duration of the tenure of this particular uh, set of leaders. The Clinton-Gore plan was to put in place a mandatory mechanism in 2008. When this was announced, I said to Vice President Gore, don't you think somebody's going to notice that the Clinton-Gore plan is to put in place a policy with real teeth precisely when a President Gore would be leaving office at the end of his second term? Uh, the Vice President did not appreciate that comment. Uh, but um, 2008 is now looking pretty good to me. If we, could, if, we could have a, if we could have a cap and trade scheme for carbon in place in 2008, at this point, I'd be rather happy. If we wait any longer than that to put in place real measures to start to bend over the curve of carbon emissions from our country and other countries, we are going to be flat unable to stop climate change at a level that still might be manageable. We will be committed to careening into the unmanageable regime, where the consequences in terms of heat waves, of uh, an increased frequency and intensity of powerful storms, floods, wildfires, rising sea level, uh, is just going to be unmanageable. We shouldn't go there. And I don't fully understand why President Bush and Vice President Cheney are, uh, are willing to go there, uh, given uh, the realities. A sobering thought. Um, Mindy, um, let's wrap up with you before turning to questions. Um, you've been in the government. Um, the organization that you now head, Ceres, has been at the forefront of engaging the business community uh, um, with uh, climate change issues. Can you? Uh, Connect the dots for us. Um, um, where do we now stand? Um, where do we go from here? What does the momentum um, of um, the last um, couple of years suggest to you about um, the next five years or so? That's a lot to answer in two or three minutes, but let me take my best shot at it. First of all, I think I said it in answering my first question, but I'm going to say it again. Climate and the order of magnitude and what it means to us as a nation, as a world, 
is not only an environmental issue, it is not only an important public policy issue, it is very definitely a business issue and an investor issue, and we need to think about it in the absence of policy. I mean, to begin with, if in f businesses like certainty, John Coomber, the international CEO of Swiss Re, spoke at a conference we ran, the International Summit on Climate Risk at the United Nations last November, um, that many of the folks here were here, uh, were at and helped lead. And he said, the best thing for business is to have certainty. So without question, the best answer to bringing this beast, and it is indeed a beast, of climate and the growing implications of it under control, or to have public policy that is uniform, that's consistent, that holds all companies to a similar playing field, industry by industry. Right now, for companies who want to act, who want to go forth and be leaders, in fact, they're penalized. If, in fact, they spend $300 million per facility to do something to clean up their carbon, to bring their carbon footprint down, they will be penalized because somebody down the block will look better to Wall Street, their competitors, for not acting. So first and foremost, in fact, the best way for corporations to change is a uniform policy. For years, we heard screaming about the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act. It was going to cost companies billions of dollars. They couldn't do it. They couldn't act. They couldn't make it happen on the timeline. In fact, the most substantial changes in cleaning up our air and our water were things like the Clean Air Act and the Clean Water Act. And I will say, once those laws passed, companies implemented them beautifully once they had clarity, timelines, knew what was expected of them, knew what they had to do. They acted, and the problems were diminished in substantial volume. That needs to happen with climate. But at the moment, Dr. Holtron is right. We are not seeing movement in Washington. I wish we were. And in fact, the burden is greater on corporate leaders and on our investor leaders in response to that. What is the role of corporations? First of all, they have got to stop thinking about issues like this as environmental issues that sit narrowly in one corner of a corporation. Issues like climate impact the overall financial well-being of a company. They're not only environmental issues. I use the example when I was the EPA regional administrator, and I have some colleagues who are here. I must have given 500 speeches. And not one of those speeches was given without referencing Abe and Jesse, my two kids, talking about their future. And that's why we should take these problems on. And that's why we must act. The reality is, as much as I love Abe and Jesse equally as much now as I did four years ago or five years ago, and they remain as important to me, the reality is we need to be looking at these things in this particular climate and for this moment as the issues that they also are, not only about the future for our children, my children and your children, but about the financial well-being of our companies. If companies continue to look at major environmental disasters climate change being the leading one by far as an issue that an environmental health and safety official ought to deal with because it's a small part of their company and it ought to be looked at a small way or companies making a mistake. These are governance issues. They run across the entirety of the firm. They run to the financial well-being of a firm. They run to the future of that firm and they need to be looked at in a whole different way. Companies need to take on issues like this as governance issues. There need to be board committees looking at them. We use the term sustainable governance. But for companies to sustain themselves in this day and age, they need to factor in the risks of climate. They need to understand what it will cost them if there are regulatory changes. They need to understand what it will cost them if there's litigation, like we are seeing, not dissimilar to asbestos and tobacco that I've referenced. They need to factor it in because their investors care about it, and they need to act and act at the highest levels. It means very real change in the companies and they need to build it into the DNA of the strategic planning of a company. What are companies doing now and what are we seeing? Over the last two or three years, particularly on that issue, we have seen some companies act on their own, and we've seen some companies act because shareholders have called on them. The Institutional Investor Network on Climate Risk, working with religious investors and social investors, have filed 25 shareholder resolutions in the last year. Over the last several years, we're seeing higher votes we're seeing more companies act, and they are acting quickly because their investors care about it. A recent example is AEP, American Electric Power, a company, the largest emitter of carbon. Everybody said they could not change, they would not change, they would never even sit down and negotiate. And in response to a shareholder resolution filed by Treasurer Napier, they saw 27% of their owners wanting them to act 
telling their board of directors to do something. This year, when that shareholder resolution was filed, they asked to have it withdrawn. They said they would rather sit down and talk, and in fact, they agreed to everything that was in that shareholder resolution, which said, assess the financial impacts of climate risk and tell us how you're going to address them and how you're going to mitigate the risk. So the role of companies is ever more important when we don't have policy solutions. They can act. The leaders acting will bring the others along. It is a governance issue and has to be seen at that. This is not a problem that's going to be fixed with the environmental health and safety vice president. Investors are watching. Shareholders are calling for change. It will have, if not now, fairly soon, a negative impact on their financial bottom line reputationally competitiveness if they don't factor issues like this and build it into their product line. Ford and GM are suffering because Toyota and others who led the way on hybrid vehicles are out front, are seizing that market. It is a business risk that they didn't act on quickly. The same thing with the electric utility industry. Leaders will get some edge. BP, Shell are looking a little bit better because they do more than other oil companies. It is building their <laughs> reputation. Companies will see that acting is good for them financially, is good for them as a company, and not acting brings enormous risks, not only financial risks, legal risks, the risk of policy that they like less. They need to act and act now, and I have faith and trust that there will be more action on the part of corporate leaders um, due to the clear implications of what's going on. This is a problem that impacts everybody. We will not see movement unless we have the cooperation and the action on everybody. We are slowly seeing activity within the corporate world. We need to see it in Washington. Uh, but for now, we need to keep moving in the le using the levers that work. The investors who own the companies are enormously valuable in prodding, in pushing, in moving companies to change they, the way they look at it, the way they think about it, and what they're doing. John, can I just build off of one thing that you sure. said there? From my perspective, as, as a trustee for pension funds, I do have to take very seriously fiduciary responsibility that we have to act in the best interest of our beneficiaries and that we act in a prudent fashion. But I also, along with that responsibility, so we, we need to make money, is basically what we're saying. We've got to be careful. We've got to be very careful. But we also have to take into account our ability to influence the behavior of corporate America. And I live in the state of Vermont. And I'm convinced of the information that John Holden has, has put forward. And I think there's a risk to our economy. Now, I'm not talking in this case strictly the beneficiaries, but I'm talking about the maple industry, the ski industry. What happens to the economy of Massachusetts if Cape Cod goes underwater? What happens to the industry in Maine if, 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 the, if the line where lobsters are, are thriving goes further and further north? Those are issues that, that we have to also take into account because actually the employer contribution for all the state employees and all the teachers of the state of Vermont come from the taxpayers in the state, corporate and individual and sales tax and so forth. And to the extent our economy doesn't thrive locally, that is going to have a direct bearing on our ability to maintain the benefit structure for the teachers and employees in our state. So we also have to take a little bit of a broader pr perspective beyond just making the money for the beneficiaries. Yes, we have to do that, but to the extent we can also influence the direction of corporate behavior and thereby the environment that will protect our and, and, and improve our, our economy, we need to take that into account as well. Thanks very much. Um, let's open that up for questions. Uh, we have um, the... Uh, we have four mics set up, two on the main floor and, and two up, uh, up above. Um, please uh, introduce yourself, keep your questions brief, and please make sure that the questions have a question mark at the end of them. Please. Um, Bill Rosenberg, I'm a senior fellow here. Um, the passion of what you're saying is very, very uh, felt by, by the audience. Um, in contrast to the passion of the American people on this issue, uh, you can look at the websites, for example, of the Kerry campaign and see a long list of, of ideas, but you can't hear him speak about that very much in the campaign itself. Uh, and that's because I think there's a perception, and properly so, that the American people don't view this as the value type issue. Uh, what could be done about that? 
Um, both of you have been elected politicians. Uh, one of you want to pick up on that? Yeah, I, I came to the philosophical conclusion, and this was hard, as, as I said, I was an activist. And you know how we all, and you, got, you almost got to this, Professor. You all, I mean, basically, underneath your remarks is, we want our leaders, our elected officials, to do the right thing. We want them to cast that risky vote to, to pass McCain-Lieberman, you know. And when it doesn't happen, what I basically think is underlying it is that we cannot expect elected officials to save us from the education and organizing that needs to happen to bring, to bring an issue consensus or, or just past consensus and it is just the hard work that has to be done and I think as Professor Holdren alluded to unfortunately we're not at that tipping point on this issue where it's, it's like New Hampshire and the kindergarten and and the, and the, you know you read about New Hampshire and the, their issues on the tax and they're not quite at the place <coughs> where any leader can 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 vote no matter how wrong we all think they are in New Hampshire, God knows, I think they're wrong in um, And so that's what I think. I'm reminded of the expression, when the people lead, the leaders will follow. Is that, that what, the way yeah. that one goes? I also think communication is, is very important. And uh, we need to you know, learn how to, to say this uh, in a straightforward, sound bite, 60 second kind of a fashion on the, on the implications of not taking action and how uh, taking action will have a positive uh, impact on people's lives. And I think this is still uh, an issue. I mean, I'm, I was struck by the fact that uh, John mentioned that in his conversations with uh, former President Clinton in 1997, the evidence then wasn't as compelling as it is now. And that wasn't very long ago. So, you know, I, I don't want to be entirely negative on this. I think uh, as, as the evidence becomes clear and how we, and as we learn to communicate it, and as uh, the people start to lead, the leaders will follow. And probably campaign finance reform would Let, help. Let's go up there. Hello, uh, my name is Spencer. Uh, I'm a sophomore at the college. Um, I have a question for Ms. Luber. Um, I was wondering, given uh, three things, one, the immediacy uh, of the problem that we're talking about right now, um, two, um, the success that you spoke of with the Clean Air Act and the uh, reductions of the emissions of sulfur uh, throughout the 90s, and three, uh, the um, political stalemate that we appear to be at um, uh, at the national level. Um, what do you think the possibility of um, immediate or maybe even long-term success with volunteer cap-and-trade systems uh, may be in the United States, um, specifically the Chicago Climate Exchange as uh, AEP, um, a company that you mentioned, and Ford, another that you mentioned, are both members of that exchange? Well, to be frank and honest, I think this problem is far too widespread, far too devastating, far too important to think we're going to fix it with voluntary measures. There is nothing wrong with voluntary measures. We ought to keep working at it. We ought to work with companies. Voluntary systems like the Chicago cap and trade system are perfectly fine. But the reality is, that would create complete inconsistency. Proactive companies will do something. Stalwarts may very well not and may benefit by not doing it. There needs to be consistency. Businesses want consistency. There needs to be across the board action and voluntary measures are not gonna do it. Now, the reality that we're talking about, in fact, Washington has been quite deliberate in stopping these things. If you look at the bright side, McCain-Lieberman is gaining votes every single day. I don't think we're quite that far away from actually having a victory there. But should that not happen, which it might not, there are state legislatures that are moving. I don't think any multinational likes being regulated state by state by state, region by region. But in the absence of federal legislation, there will be state legislation. California passed a bill, New York's in the process, New England has things, Massachusetts has a climate change program. One way or the other, I think there will need to be mandatory imperatives that create a level playing field, that make sure more numbers rather than fewer numbers are actually acting, and that are working with specificity to bring the carbon footprint down. Um, short of that, in the absence of that, we shouldn't sit and 
say, woe is me, you know, we're not passing federal legislation. We need to act the kind of action once you get one company to act and make them a hero and create case studies and bring other uh, players within their industry uh, to buy into part of that will get change. But it will not come fast enough. It will not be across the board. We need to make sure the other pressures are forcing it. The European Union, as of January 1st, 2005, will be creating a carbon trading system that has a cost on the price of carbon. It is things like that that are across the board that are really going to make a difference, and we need to keep pushing. We'll go up there next. Yes, it's a question for uh, Professor Holdren. Can you introduce yourself, please? Uh, John Fry. I'm a, uh, not affiliated with the university. I'm just a uh, citizen here in Cambridge. <coughs> uh, Professor Holdren, the question relates to your comments regarding the uh, scenario you presented if uh, changes are not implemented by 2008. And if I understood you correctly, you presented a, quite a negative scenario of outcomes, negative outcomes. Uh, <clears throat> so three questions related to that. Could you present the data and the scientific proof for your assertions in terms of the negative outcomes? Uh, secondly, could you address the potential um, uh, measures that companies and governments and society could implement over a period of time, because it's my understanding that, for instance, the climate change is in the next 100 years is going to be something like one or two degrees Fahrenheit 100 years from now. You can address that more validly. <clears throat> and fi finally, the third question is, are you contending that there's no valid scientific dissension regarding uh, the amount of climate change and the outcomes of climate change? Let me start with the last one first. What I said was that the knowledgeable community is now in agreement that climate is changing in ways that are unusual compared to natural variation and that humans are playing a significant role in that. There is disagreement across a range of values for how fast the change will proceed, how much climate change will have by 2030, by 2050, by 2100. There's a range of values that are argued about. The numbers you stated are at the far low end of that range. That is, the estimates for what the temperature rise could be by the year 2100 fall typically in the range of one and a half to seven and a half degrees centigrade roughly twice that many degrees Fahrenheit. Those are figures for the global average warming. Mid-continent warming will be two to three times greater. Northern latitude warming greater still. We have already seen warming in the range of five to seven degrees Fahrenheit in Alaska, for example. Much more is to be expected. At the same time, as you suggest, there is disagreement about the details of the pattern of impacts of those kinds of changes. The point that is perhaps worth underlining is that the middle of the road projection of what is likely, the midstream position, if you will, the mainstream position in the scientific community, is a pretty grim picture. It is possible that it will be better than that. It is also possible that it will be worse than that. A prudent decision maker would be unwise to bet that the mainstream position will turn out to be wrong. Again, it could be better, it could be worse, but we're talking about making bets on an inherently uncertain future, and to bet against the current scientific consensus would be to bet against strong odds. That's not what most of the people who manage money prefer to do. Thank you. Um, next question. Hi, Anthony Pat. I'm on the faculty at Boston University's Center for Energy and Environmental Studies. And this is a question from Ms. Lumber. You suggested that the risks that corporations could be facing is on an order of magnitude of similar to that of asbestos or tobacco. This is the next asbestos or tobacco you said. And yet, I want, I'd like you if you could clarify where you see those risks primarily. Obviously here we can talk about three risks or three kinds of risks that corporations face. The first is from 
the direct impacts or the indirect impacts of climate change. If you are building a factory on Cape Cod and, and there's sea level rise, well, probably the mean sea level rise isn't going to hurt you, but the extreme events associated with that may hurt you. So there's a f risks from the actual impact. The second would be risks due to a change in the regulatory climate. And this also is probably very difficult to assess. I mean, obviously, Kyoto, if it actually goes into force, and if the United States makes that kind of commitment, is going to change the whole business climate. But as we all know and should be admitting, if we're actually going to solve this problem and achieve some sort of carbon stabilization scenario, the level of cuts are going to be, have to be much, much more, you know, many times the order of magnitude of Kyoto. And then the third kind of risk is actual liability for um, the changes to the climate which affect the world in general and liability that one firm may face. Um, I'd actually, I suspect that you were talking about this last one, I mean, when you said the next asbestos or tobacco, and I'm interested if, if that is in fact what you were meaning, and, and if so, what are the obstacles to overcome? Because of course, with climate change, unlike asbestos or tobacco, there's not a, a smallish number of firms whom one could assign liability, but it's all of us. I mean, we're, we are all the ones creating the problem. Sure. Well, you answered a good part of the question yourself, and eloquently at that. There are major risks, and they run from physical. And you gave a few good examples. Treasurer Spaulding talked about what happens to the maple industry. Slight changes in weather to agriculture, to the lettuce industry in California, to the wine industry, to agriculture across the country could devastate particular crops in particular year totaling billions of dollars. So right there, there's the ski industry, there's electric utility industry, and the cost, the auto industry, the oil and gas. We can talk about dozens upon dozens of industries that add up to hundreds of billions of dollars. That alone is a risk. A company who is operating in those industries and not acting or creating risks for their shareholders that they don't have a business for creating and their board members are not allowed to create. Their job is to assess risk plan for risk and mitigate it. The second round of risk that you talked about is regulatory risk, and you say it's hard to assess. It is a little bit hard to assess, but we've got an example right now. Shareholder resolutions were filed asking a number of companies to assess the financial implications from regulatory change. We sat in negotiations with the state of Connecticut, AEP, Synergy, and other companies. We laid out which regulatory changes we'd like them to assess, and indeed they can. Companies have great resources, and I don't only mean financially, to answer questions when they're focused and when they're asked. AEP sat down the largest emitter of carbon in the country, assessed the financial risk from McCain, Lieberman, and other things, and said a number of things. It's huge. We can manage it. We do better with certainty. So that's a second kind of risk. They can assess it, and it's crucial to ask them to assess it. For companies that don't examine what the problem is, who choose to keep their head in the sand, they may very well not know. Part of the goal and the reason the treasurers were talking about disclosure is you want companies to disclose, to examine what their imp their footprint is from carbon and what it will cost to address that. And the only way they can do it is by first examining risk. Um, so the second kind of risk is regulatory risk, and it can be assessed. The third is legal risk. We talked about it. Um, it varies, but there are already lawsuits against specific industries, not every industry, but that are facing risk. There are people talking about bringing lawsuits against individual board members for breach of their fiduciary duty, for not acting on a major problem that could cost their company hundreds of millions of dollars if they act, if they don't act. Um, so the risks vary. They go beyond that to reputational risks. BP will do better than Exxon because they've acted and they have a good reputation on sust sustainability issues. Um, and there are competitive risks. GM and Ford are falling behind because Toyota and other Japanese companies are leading. So there's an amalgam of risks. They all get evaluated differently, but they add up to enough to make the argument for why companies ought to act and act now. Well, let's quickly go over here. Okay. Uh, my name is Humphrey, Humphrey Wong. I'm a mid-career MPA at the Kennedy School. Um, I'm going to take a chance and try to uh, adopt what I've been learning in the last couple of weeks of classes. Um, we were told that uh, a famous activist, Ray Rogers, tackled the textile, uh, textile, textile um, 
manufacturer, J.P. Stevens, by adopting a corporate strategy in which he identified key players who could exert influence on J.P. Stevens and basically had a sort of a domino approach to, to the problem. My question is, uh, and it does sound like this perhaps has already been done, but have key influentials, I guess they call them, uh, been identified in the investment and business community who would be sort of the first of a set of dominoes to fall. Uh, and if they aren't willing to negotiate, I guess, uh, have they done any sort of, have you or anyone else done backward mapping to see who would be the people to, to contact? Mindy, that's probably yeah. you. Sure, uh, very quickly, and then I'll let um, Treasurer Spalding and McCormick speak to it, who are part of the key influentials. We have been working with major institutional investors, Phil Angelides in California and Alan Hevesy in New York and Denise Napier in Connecticut and the two treasurers sitting here who have enormous influence, whose assets add up to trillions of dollars to make a difference. They can influence other treasurers. We need to bring together a massive group of institutional investors, not just small ones. But who else has influence like that? Board members. If you take a look at what did DuPont do? DuPont, because they had three or four board members who put, put together a committee and said, it is in our business interest to act to reduce our carbon footprint now, not later. If we do it later, it will cost us more money. If we have to wait for regulation, we'll be forced to do it in a way we don't like. We want to do it in our terms. We want to act. We want to get the competitive advantage. We want to get the reputational advantage. We want to bring our cost down and start doing it now. So finding the right board members with the right perspective, the right investment leaders, the right academic leaders are about building the critical mass to get there. One last question up here. Yeah, Imad, Imad Korda, PhD in engineering here at Harvard. Uh, my question is, how can like, we make, we let corporates buy into that when, for example, we don't address the problem at the global scale? And, and the other question is, I, I was missing the foreign policy because I, I think this is also an issue on foreign policy, especially when we look at emerging markets like China. Uh, when the U.S. shies away from Kyoto, how we would make China come into it? John, you want to take a crack at that? Yeah, I'll, I'll take a quick crack at that. We do uh, ultimately need to address it at global scale. There's no question about that. And if we uh, finally reject uh, the Kyoto Agreement, we better have something else to replace it. We basically have two choices. We can try to fix the shortcomings in the Kyoto Agreement, and there are some, uh, or we can replace it uh, with a quite different agreement. But one way or the other, this problem will have to be tackled globally. On the other hand, the industrial nations led by the United States have created about three quarters of this problem up until the present moment. That is, we've been responsible for three quarters of the accumulation of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere from the beginning of the Industrial Revolution until now that are driving this problem. And so it is reasonable to expect that we should lead, that we should lead the way in starting to take the measures to bring this problem under control, and that the developing countries will follow. And I think they will follow because most of them already recognize that they are at risk from climate change too. It is wrong to suppose that China and India aren't interested in this problem. I spend a fair amount of time in both countries, and they are interested. But we really have to understand the time scales. I may have been misunderstood before when I said, we've got to solve this problem by 2008. We have to start by 2008 putting in place, as Mindy suggests, a level playing field, a set of requirements and incentives and targets and mechanisms that will start to move us in the right direction, because there is tremendous inertia in this problem. A typical power plant operates for 40 or 50 years before it's replaced. If we want the energy system in the middle of this century to look very different than it looks now, we need to start changing it now, because the power plants that are on the drawing boards today and that will go into operation in 2010 will still be running in 2050. We need to start on this problem, and we ought to start in the industrialized nations, beginning with the United States, who have gotten us the greatest distance into this predicament in the first place. 
Thank you, John. In, in closing, I want to, um, to thank um, the uh, Corporate Social Responsibility Initiative and the uh, Energy Technology Innovation Project. Uh, Jane Nelson and Kelly Gall Gallagher are sitting in the front here. Thank you both for co-sponsoring this. And thank you very much for our uh, illuminating discussion from the panel. You've, you've taken um, a, a, gl a global abstract issue and brought it down to a level of specificity that I think we can all relate to and we're deeply appreciative of your having done so. Thank you very much.